You know, I've been thinking about peace a lot. Not just the church, but peace. What it means to have peace in our spirits. What it means to truly be at peace. And, you know, it's really fitting to go to old scriptures when you're thinking of peace. And when we read the Old Testament, we find people that hadn't known God for so long, but had faith that could move mountains. We find people that hadn't encountered God and carried God with them for eternity, and yet still had peace in their spirits because they knew God. And I wonder, when I walk around the world today, do we really know God? Do we really have peace in our spirits, in our souls, with the full understanding that God is on our side, that God holds us, that God loves us, that we are being propelled forward to stand in courage, to stand in faith, and to truly embody love. All of that breaks down. All of that cracks and falters if we don't have peace. You pray with me. Giving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the way that you dwell, for the heart that you plant inside of us, a heart of compassion, a heart of truth, a heart of grace, that we might come to encounter your love in our lives, that we might truly embody it, not just wearing it, but being it. In every opportunity, in every instance, that we are being propelled forward as agents of peace, as instruments of love that you might transform our spirits, however tattered, however broken, that you might transform us from the inside out into all that we were called to be, not into our vision of what our lives might be, to our vision of what we have been called to be, but into your vision of who we are. And we sit in that vision we sit in that love, and we sit enveloped in that grace, and we give thanks for it, from one degree of glory to the next. And the people of God proclaim together. Now, I can't stop thinking about this question. What is the value of faith? What is its value? How do we value it? Why? Do we value it? And what's it worth in our lives? Does it really move the needle for us in those times of stress, in those times that we encounter storms in this life? Does it really make a difference at all? Does it change the way that we move through this life? Does it change the way that we maneuver? Or is it just an outfit that we put on on Sunday? It looks good. We need to make a Facebook post about how much we love Jesus. Is it just something that we pull out of the drawer whenever it's convenient? You know, as we dived deep into the dark of our spirits this Lent, we, we started to discover some wounds. And I'm sure for some of you, those wounds were new. or wounds that you didn't know you had, or you pretended like you didn't know that you had. The truth is, if we leave those wounds untreated, they start to rot us from the inside out. If we're not careful, before we even realize it, there's nothing left of us, nothing of substance. All that we wear is our trauma. And every decision that we make is a reaction to that trauma, to that pain that we carry. No longer are we embodying truth, or love, or peace, we are just embodying our pain. And that's no way to live. But the only way that we begin to heal those wounds, to truly heal, is to allow the light of God 
to shine on us. And in order for that light to shine on those wounds, we have to be vulnerable. We have to bear them all before God. We have to be naked, exposed. And frankly, that's the step that a lot of us aren't willing to take. We can acknowledge those wounds. We can say, hey, we have them. But to truly put them on display in front of God, well, that's one step too far. To allow that kind of vulnerability requires trust. It requires a nakedness, and it most certainly requires us to have strength and faith. And my friends, it requires us to value our faith more than our doubts, more than our pride, to value our faith more than our control. That thing we seem unwilling to relinquish. And for some of us, that's out of the question. That's a step too far. And I get it. But here's the question. How firm is our foundation if it's our faith itself that holds it up? And that faith is shattered and cracked and in need of deep repair. How solid is the armor that we wear if there are holes everywhere we look? How long before that rain starts to soak you from the inside out? So instead of bolstering our foundation, instead of repairing those cracks in our spirits and our faith, instead of repairing those holes, we choose to run the other way. We choose to search for a new foundation, some some better armor. We read the reviews and ah, this is the way to go. There's got to be something better. And when our faith falters, It does so as a result of our negligence. And we chalk it up to a failure of God. Well, God didn't show up for me in my time of need. God didn't do everything that I asked. God didn't save us from ourselves. Well, my friends, freedom, well, it isn't really free, is it? Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John. And John is different than all of the other Gospels. And he's not afraid to say exactly what he means in the way that he means it. And it comes from chapter 16 here. And it's directly from the words of Jesus. In a day or so, you're not going to see me. But in another day or so, you will see me. And that stirred up a, a hornet's nest of questions among the disciples. What's he talking about? In a day or so, you're not going to see me, but, but then in a day, another day or so, you, you will see me. And because I'm on my way to the Father, what is this day or so? We don't know what he's talking about. And Jesus knew that they were dying to ask him what he meant. And so he said, are you trying to figure it out among yourselves, what I meant when I said, in a day or so, you're not going to see me. But then in another day, or so, you will see me. Then fix this firmly in your minds. You're going to be in deep mourning while the godless world throws a party. You'll be very, very sad, but your sadness will develop into gladness. When a woman gives birth, she has a hard time and there's no getting around it, but when the baby is born, there is joy in the birth. This new life in the world wipes out memory of the pain. The sadness you have right now is similar to the pain, but the coming joy is also similar. When I see you again, you will be full of joy, and it will be a joy that no one, no one can rob from you. You'll no longer be so full of questions. This is what I want you to do. Ask the Father for whatever is keeping, in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be like a river overflowing its banks. I've used figures of speech in telling you these things, and soon I'll drop the figures and tell you about the Father in plain language. And then you can make your request directly to him, 
in relation to this life I've revealed for you. I won't continue to make requests to the Father on your behalf. I won't need to. Because you've gone out on a limb, committed yourselves to love and trust in me, believing that I came directly from the Father, and the Father loves you directly. First I left the Father and arrived in the world. Now I leave the world and travel to the Father. His disciples said, finally, finally you're giving it to us straight in plain talk. No more figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything. It all comes together in you. You won't have to put up with our questions anymore. We're convinced that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it, saving your own skins, abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all of this so that in trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart. I've conquered the world. You know, this is a text that I've read a lot in my life. And every single time I read, I find assurance. There's an assurance in the fact that Jesus had no disillusionment. He was not confused. He saw completely exactly how the disciples were going to receive this. He had no doubts about the struggles that they'd encounter as they dealt with his death, about the pain that they'd feel, but he also recognized joy on the other side of all of that. And he both honored that pain while also celebrating that joy. We don't escape from our darkness unscathed, not in any way, but we do escape transformed. And in the light of that transformation, we're called to center ourselves on God, to truly give God permission to let light shine. And that's hard to do. It's hard to get permission to heal again. It's so easy to let traditions and our habits and our own desires cloud the vision before us. It's hard to relinquish control and allow God to do what God has called us. And God is perpetually leading us towards change, towards evolution, towards growth, towards loving people in spite of everything else and loving ourselves despite any of those cracks or those flaws, towards removing ourselves from this pursuit of religion, from just wearing faith when it's convenient, when it's comfortable, to allowing ourselves to be faithful servants of God. In Galatians, Paul writes, I suspect that you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior. Faith expressed in love. We see this idea of faith and this idea of faith expressed in love as this beautiful thing. That's something you would see at Hobby Lobby, put on the wall. It's beautiful, right? And you see love and it just makes you feel warm inside. But we miss part of the message in that. It's not just love itself, it's faith expressed in love. So if we don't value faith, Where does that leave us? Without love. Without love. And so what do we do in that lonely place? When we lost hope and trust in our faith and we're far from love. But friends, we run. We run as far and as fast as we can 
We run in the opposite direction and we pretend like everything is okay. We just go about our business like nothing is wrong. And we look to have faith in everyone and everything except for God. We put our faith in people and in institutions and in things and ourselves, but no longer God. Because God let us down, right? God let us down. But that's not really the truth, is it? Instead of sitting down with the reality that we've lost faith because it just wasn't important to us, we just run away in the other direction. And we run and we run and we run until we've convinced ourselves that God failed and not us. Like if we could just fake it for long enough, suddenly that'll become our reality. Suddenly our pain will go away. Suddenly those wounds will magically heal and the world will be as kind as we want it to be. But that's not the way that it works. It's just not. But here's why Jesus, Jesus is king. He knew his disciples. He absolutely knew his disciples. And guess what? He knows you too. Absolutely knows you. He knew exactly what we do at the first sign of those cracks in our faith. And what does he say? Do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it. You think you believe, but you're about to run the other way. You're about to save your own skins and abandon me, but I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace, that in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart, I have conquered the world. My friends, I know you wanna run, I get it. It's the way of the world. That that spirit inside of you is scared about what's before us. And I can't say that you're wrong for that fear. I can't tell you that you won't suffer in this life because I can guarantee that you, that you will. That you'll encounter tragedies and struggles. It's part of being human. I can't tell you that you won't have moments where you just want to white knuckle that wheel because you're so deeply afraid. Because fear is part of life. You absolutely will. I can't tell you that you won't have moments where you want to sprint the other way because you're sure in your spirit that God won't show up for you. Because doubt is also a part of our human existence. But hear this. Moments pass. They absolutely do. They last for a moment and then they're gone. But eternity is forever. And that's what lays before us. You entered into this faith earnestly, fully trusting God, fully believing in the strength of the God that walks before us and the strength of the God that holds you. Completely committed. Don't lose faith now. God will find you wherever you are in this journey and cover you with a grace that knows no bounds. And if you're willing to strip those barriers, if you're willing to stand before God in all vulnerability, in all nakedness, if you're only willing to give God permission to shine. I told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace, in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart. I've conquered the world. The only thing standing between you and God is the brokenness that you're choosing to wear. What does that mean if you were to just take it off? What, if it, what, what does it mean if you were to stand before God in your naked faith? The truth is we can't outrun our problems. We just can't. They're so much faster than we give them credit for. But we can grow a faith that is stronger than even the biggest obstacle. But that takes patience. 
That takes trust, and most importantly, it takes faith. But it's worth it. So the question before you is, how much do you value your faith? From Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Thanks be to God. These are your thoughts, Tita. This is the hope of God set free. These are your thoughts,